Hello there and welcome to this Beyond Shakespeare exploring session in which we are looking at the Witch of Edmonton. Um, the Witch of Edmonton has not one, not two, but three authors, Thomas Decker, John Ford and William Rowley, or William Rowley, I'm not entirely sure how it's pronounced. Um, and it was first performed, we think, around 1621. Um, According to eminent scholars, and I can't tell you which ones because uh, I actually got this straight from the Wikipedia entry for the play, uh, it says that The Witch of Edmonton is probably the most sophisticated treatment of a domestic tragedy in the whole of Elizabethan Jacobean drama. Um, so, yeah, that's raised my expectations. You might even say I have great expectations. Mm. <laughs> Uh, you see what I did there, and we're looking forward to seeing uh, if it lives up to that to that billing. Um, helping me uh, to spell through this hopefully spooky play, we have the following wonderful readers uh, with us today. So, reading Carter or Banks and Dog is hello. I'm Eric, and yeah, I was just changing the books under my mic for a change. <laughs> All, all, always useful. Uh, reading Frank and Mother Sawyer is... Hello, I'm Lois, living in London. Reading Old Thorny and First Clown is... Hi, my name's Elizabeth Amisu and I'm an author based in Romford. Reading the prologue, Susan and Cuddy is... Hello, I'm Lynn Freitas. I'm a college composition teacher coming to you from the rainy northwestern United States. Reading Sir Arthur Warbeck, uh, third, no, sir, no, reading Sir Arthur, separate character Warbeck, <laughs> and separate character Third Clown is Rachel, actor on the East Coast. And reading Winifred, Summerton, Fourth Clown and Second Clown is... Brian Sparrow, actor in the East Midlands. And I am your host today, Sarah Blake, stepping in for Robert Crichton. And I'm also going to step in uh, very briefly to play Catherine. So let's get going with The Witch of Edmonton. Um, the scene is the town and neighbourhood of Edmonton unsurprisingly, uh, which for those of you who don't know is just a sort of suburb of North London. Well, it is now. It's probably a little village back then. And uh, we begin with the prologue, which according to this copy of the text I'm looking at was originally performed by someone <coughs> called Master Bird, which is kind of a cool name. Uh, but today is going to be performed by Lynn. So take it away, Lynn. The town of Edmonton hath lent the stage a devil and a witch, both in an age. To make comparisons, it were uncivil between so even a pair, a witch and devil. But as, as the year doth with his plenty bring, as well a latter as a former spring, so hath this witch enjoyed the first, and reason presumes she may partake the other season. In Acts deserving name, the proverb says, once good and ever. Why not so in plays? Why not in this, since gentlemen we flatter? No expectations. Here is mirth and matter. And we'll go straight into Act 1, Scene 1, and to Frank Thorny and Winifred, who is with child. Come, wench. Hi. Here's a business soon dispatched. Thy heart, I know, is now at ease. Thou needst not fear what the tattling gossips in their cups can speak against thy fame. Thy child shall know whom to call dad now. You have here discharged the true part of an honest man. I cannot request a fuller satisfaction than you have freely granted. Yet, methinks, tis an hard case, being lawful man and wife, we should not live together. Uh, had I failed in promise of my truth to thee, we must have then been ever sundered. Now the longest of our forbearing either's company is only but to gain a little time for our continuing thrift. That so hereafter the heir that shall be born may not have caused to curse his hour of birth, which made him feel the misery of beggary and want, 
two devils that are occasions to enforce a shameful end. My plots aim but to keep my father's love. And that will be as difficult to be preserved when he shall understand how you are married, as it will be now, should you confess it to him? Fathers are won by degrees, not bluntly, as our masters or wronged friends are. And besides, I'll use such dutiful and ready means that ere he can have no notice of what's past, the inheritance to which I am born heir shall be assured. That done, why, let him know it. If he like it not, yet he shall have no power in him left to cross the thriving of it. You who had the conquest of my maiden love may easily conquer the fears of my distrust, and whither must I be hurried? Oh, prithee, do not use a word so much unsuitable to the constant affections of thy husband. Thou shalt live near Waltham Abbey with thy uncle, Selman. I have acquainted him with all at large. He'll use thee kindly. Thou shalt want no pleasures nor any other fit supplies, whatever thou canst in heart desire. All these are nothing without your company. Which thou shalt have once every month at least. Once every month? Is this to have an husband? Uh, uh, perhaps oftener. Uh, that's as occasion serves. Ay, ay, in case no other beauty tempt your eye, whom you like better, I may chance to be remembered and see you now and then. Faith, I did hope you'd not have used me so, but tis my fortune, and yet, if not for my sake, have some pity upon the child I go with. That's your own, and lest you'll be a cruel-hearted father, you cannot but remember that. Heaven knows how. Uh, to quit which fear at once, as by the ceremony late performed, I plighted thee of faith, as free from challenge as any double thought. Once more, in hearing of heaven and thee, I vow that never henceforth disgrace, reproof, lawless affections, threats, or what can be suggested against our marriage shall cause me falsify that bridal oath that binds me thine. And, Winifred, Whenever the wanton heat of youth, by subtle baits of beauty, or what woman's art can practice, draw me from only loving thee, let heaven inflict upon my life some fearful ruin. I hope thou dost believe me. Swear no more. I am confirmed and will resolve to do what you think most behoveful for us. Thus then, make thyself ready. At the furthest house upon the green without the town, your uncle expects you. For a little time, farewell. Sweet. We shall meet again as soon as thou canst possibly? We shall. One kiss. Away. And Winifred exits. Enter Sir Arthur Clarington. Frank Thorny. Now here, sir. Alone? Then must I tell thee in plain terms thou hast wronged to thy master's house basely and lewdly? Your house, sir? Yes, sir. If the nimble devil that wantoned in your blood rebelled against all rules of honest duty, you might, sir, have found out some more fitting place than here to have built a stews in. All the country whispers how shamefully thou hast undone a maid. Approved for modest life, for civil carriage, till thy prevailing perjuries enticed her to forfeit shame. Will you be honest yet? Make her amends and marry her? Uh, so, sir, I might bring both myself and her to beggary, and that would be a shame worse than the other. You should have thought on this before, and then your reason would have overswayed the passion of your unruly lust, but that you may be left without excuse to solve the infamy of my disgraced house, because you are a gentleman, and both of you my servants, I'll make the maid a portion. Ha, so you promised me before in case I married her. 
I know Sir Arthur Clarington deserves the credit report hath lent him, and presume you are a debtor to your promise. Uh, but upon what certainty shall I resolve? Uh, excuse me for being somewhat rude. It is but reason. Well, Frank, what thinkst thou of two hundred pounds and a continual friend? Though my poor fortunes might happily prefer me to a choice of a far greater portion, yet to right a wronged maid and to preserve your favor, I am content to accept your proffer. Art thou? Sir, we shall every day have need to employ the use of what you please to give. Thou shalt have to. Then I claim your promise. We are man and wife. Already? And more than so, sir, I have promised her free entertainment in her uncle's house near Waltham Abbey, where she may securely sojourn till time and my endeavors work my father's love and liking. Honest Frank. I hope, sir, you will think I cannot keep her without a daily charge. As for the money, tis all thine own. And though I cannot make thee a present payment, yet thou shalt be sure I will not fail thee. Uh, but our occasions... Nay, nay, talk not of your occasions. Trust my bounty. It shall not sleep, hast married her. If faith, Frank. Tis well, tis passing well, then. Winifred, once more thou art an honest woman. Frank, thou hast a jewel. Love her, she'll deserve it. And went to Walton. Uh, she's making ready. Her uncle stays for her. Most provident speed. Frank, I will be thy friend, and such a friend. Thou'lt bring her hither? Thither? Uh, sir, I, I cannot. Uh, newly, my father sent me word I should come to him. Marry, and do. I know thou hast a wit to handle him. I have a suit to ye. What is't? Anything, Frank, command it. Uh, that you'll please by letters to assure my father that I am not married. How? Uh, someone or other hath certainly informed him that I purposed to marry Winifred, on which he threatened to disinherit me. Uh, to prevent it, lowly I crave your letters, which he seeing will credit, and I hope ere I return, on such conditions as I'll frame, uh, his lands shall be assured. But what is there to quit? My knowledge of the marriage? Why, you were not a witness to it. I conceive, and then his land confirmed, thou wilt acquaint him thoroughly with all that's past. I mean no less. <laughs> provided I never was made privy toot. Alas, sir, am I a talker? Draw thyself the letter. I'll put my hand to it. I commend thy policy. Thou'rt witty, witty, Frank. Nay, nay, tis fit. Dispatch it. I shall write effectually. And Frank exits, and we'll just take a moment to pause there mid-scene, just to uh, unpack what's happened already, because... Uh, I, I, I gather from the chat that people are slightly confused as to <laughs> who is who and what is going on. Um, so you have here um, Frank Thorny, young young Frank, uh, who's a, a local gentleman, but he's also um, a servant to Sir Arthur. So I assume he's not an actual kind of like a manservant. He's more of like a he's employed by him, I assume, um, because he is a gentleman in his own right and the son of old Thorny who we haven't met yet and we've got sir arthur and then we've got winifred and Mi winifred is a maid um we know this from the dramatis persona she's a she's a maid in sir arthur's house so it looks as though uh frank has um fallen for the charms of winifred a little too strongly and is now has now married her because of the ensuing consequences and sir arthur seems to be you know sort of quite uh you know p pleased about that frank's doing the right thing he's he's offered them money uh lynn what's your take on this 
my take is that I'm muted. Um, the, the fact that Frank is a gentleman and in service, that's not at all unusual. Almost everyone below the rank of royalty went into service at some point in their in their youth. You just took one step or a half step above on the, the social ladder and you, you became a, a gentleman in the household. Frank might actually be Arthur's Stuart, like the head of his household, uh, and then Winifred would 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 be one of the more sort of below stairs um, servants. So uh, below him in social rank, but they could both be servants of of Sir Arthur. And you know, if you were an earl, you went into service to a duke, and 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 so forth. So it's not unusual for someone who's a gentleman or even you know, lower ranking nobility to go into service in the household of someone slightly above them on the social ladder. Hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, Rachel and Elizabeth. Um, so what Lynn just said, then uh, if, if um, Winifred's a maid of Sir Arthur's, could she possibly be lower ranking nobility, maybe lower ranking than uh, Frank, is that his name, than Frank? And um, Sir Arthur is trying to make sure that uh, um, Frank remains honorable in these intentions and marries her because, like, if her family finds out that in his house she's meddled with, that it could bring some sort of discredit to himself or to his house. Yes, that's um, that's certainly uh, that's that's definitely one way. Uh, it, you could look at this. Um, I mean, yes, I would say, as as Lynn said, I think Winifred is very much below stairs, so she's a she's a maid. And then, yes, uh, Frank is like a a steward or his man of business. So although he's working for him, he's not he's not like he's on his household staff, but he's not actually he's not actually a servant class. Whereas Winifred is, so there's quite a big disparity. And yes, it appears he is he is encouraging Frank to do the right thing. Um, and Frank has uh, said to him, well, can you make sure my father doesn't find out? Because of course, with him being a higher class than Winifred, although Sir Arthur is encouraging him to do the right thing, he, he would actually be married, well, he has already uh, married below below his station, as it were. Um, Lois, I'll come to you in a minute, but I saw Elizabeth's hand earlier. Yeah, briefly, just speaking to what you just said, Sarah, I have all my thoughts at the moment in the text are about Frank. Mm. Like, what kind of person is he? First of all, he says he'll see Winifred once a month, mm. which is like unbelievable that he would come out with that. And then he wants to get Sir Arthur to kind of lie for him to, so that he doesn't get disinherited. And I just feel like Frank is this sort of disingenuous character. We we start off the text with him, but we're not on his side. That's a really interesting point. I wonder if everybody else feels the same way. Lois, you had a you had a point too. Yeah, well, just, just that although uh, Frank is in Sir Arthur's service, clearly his financial dependence is on his father, not on. Yeah. Well, Sir Arthur. I mean, Sir Arthur does make him this quite generous present in order to, uh, but you notice he's deceiving everybody. He even waits until Sir Arthur has confirmed this gift before he says, I have in fact married her. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and he's clearly deceiving his father. Uh, we just hope he's not deceiving Winifred. And uh, he's made a very solemn promise to her as well. Uh, and when people make promises like that, you know, you can assume that something is going to happen later. Yes, yes. The fact that he's 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 sworn like you know, may my life be ruined if I if I ever cause you unhappiness. You think, oh mate, that's <laughs> that's a little that's a little hasty, maybe. But you know, he has he has married her, uh, so there is that. And he does, to be fair to Frank, I'm just going to uh, su support Frank here. He does say at one point, um, I can't actually fa find it now, but he. His, he does say that my plots aim but to keep my father's love. Fathers are not won by degrees, not bluntly. Um, you know, so he's he's basically saying that he, he needs to work on him a bit. So the fact that he's sending Winifred off, um, you know, and uh, and 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 sort of getting Sir Arthur to 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 practice a bit of skullduggery in 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 signing this letter to his father, is there a good intention behind it? 
maybe, because he's just sort of trying to get his dad on side and he knows he needs time to work up to that. What what do we think? Um, Lois, then Rachel. Oh, no, and Bryony. Bryony first, actually, because I saw her hand earlier. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, um, uh, I, I, I had a point and, and it's gone. So maybe somebody else first. OK, uh, I'll come back to you. Uh, Lois, then Rachel. Yeah, well, it's just that uh, uh, he wants to be sure that he inherits. I mean, he should logically be the heir to his father's estate anyway, but his father will disinherit him if he discovers that he's married Winifred. Uh, so he's planning to uh, make sure that the estate is completely signed over to him. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if he's, he's not actually waiting for his father to die. He must be waiting for some financial arrangement and then he will let him know when it will be too late for his father to do anything about it. Yeah. But uh, you could say that, you know, uh, it would be even worse if he, which is what he says to Sir Arthur actually initially, that if he were to marry her, it would be financial ruin, which would be even worse than disgrace. Not for her, presumably, but uh, <laughs> in a way, uh, you know. Uh, so it, I suppose there, there's sort of argument there that it's, it's reasonable enough to try to, to keep the, the money that you're basically entitled to anyway. Yes, especially if the reason for his father disinheriting him is because he's had the temerity to marry a maid and, and actually behave in an honorable way. I, I, I think there's maybe a bit of ambiguity there. Um, Bryony, your point has come back to you. Yeah, um, it's because I, I, you, you dredged up another point in my head, and there were two vying, and I couldn't work out what I was trying to say. Um, so on the Frank front, I'm, I'm not that sympathetic because he's in a position of power, and he, he did the deed in the first place. So yeah, you could say he's being honourable, maybe by marrying her and stuff, but he, he, he abused that power situation in the first place. To get her in the family way um but my my point that i had initially was about winifred and just the fact that we we don't really we haven't been given a lot at all on her just yet she's behaving in the way that that we can understand conventionally pretty much any woman of the time would behave if she's found herself in this situation she's she's worried about self-preservation and whatnot and she's a bit naive in in believing everything that he says and beyond that we don't really know anything about her yet she does seem to be genuinely fond of him, though, doesn't she? The fact that, you know, when he says, oh, I'll try and get over to see you once a month, she's like, what? <laughs> you know, once a month? I mean, you know, some women in that situation would go, yeah, that's fine. Once a month is fine. <laughs> you know, so I, I, I'm thinking that maybe she does, she does have some genuine feeling for him. Rachel, I saw your hand earlier. Yeah, it was to Elizabeth's point. Um, how this opens with Frank, it, it, this creates so much suspense in a way because um, all the social pressures uh, on Frank that he's relying on his father and some of the things he's saying to her, um, you know, that uh, what Bryony just said, that he's higher rank, that he's in the position of power, that all these things should say that he doesn't want to be, you know, honorable, but his words go against that. And Winifred comes in and it seems like she's trying to, you know, pull more from him. And then Arthur comes in and he's coming in and there seems to be um, some, I, I don't want to say skepticism, but there could be, and you could play it that way in a production from the other characters. And it, it to put that, to use Frank in this way, it creates this uh, feeling for the audience of not knowing um, if we're dealing, uh, you know, Frank isn't the narrator, but it's almost like, do we believe this guy, this narrator? Is he being completely honest with us too? You know, not just the characters and the thing. It's a, uh, uh, to you know, and it's a. I think it's a great way to begin because it's kind of pulling us, pulling us in, and and making us want to continue and participate emotionally with this uh, play so far. Yes, absolutely. It's a cracking beginning because you're immediately thrown into the situation of like, oh, oh. Who's telling the truth? Who's lying? What's happening? Let's find out. It's it's really good. Uh, Brian, is that is that half a hand or or not? It is, but I think Eric was had had his up first. Right, Eric, Eric, then Bryony. I, I was just going to say that there was a moment where I was like, is this is Sir Arthur about the blackmail guy? Because um, you know, Sir Arthur has been quite honest thus far, and then sort of goes, but what is there to quit my knowledge of the marriage? As if like. Okay, so how are you gonna how how do you plan to sort of pull this shit off, um, if I may say so? Um, and then it just feels a bit like sort of two criminals sorting out their kind of shtick. 
um, like, yeah, we have to tell the same story or else we won't be able to, you know, get mm. very far. Mm, interesting. I mean, you could you could say that Sir Arthur is just because because Frank has asked him to lie to his father. It could be that he he's just he doesn't he wants to make sure that that isn't going to come back to to bite him. Maybe you could you could you could see it as the uh, actions of a very honourable man. Uh, but we'll we'll find out in a second. And uh, Bryony, yes. I just wanted to ask the people that know a bit more about the time and stuff. Um, would there would there have been any shame on him for doing this? Would there have been any sort of a black mark? on his, because we, we know that she'd have been absolutely ruined if he'd just left her, knocked her up and left her. But would that, even just in terms of rumours, and would, would there be any besmirching of his name by that or? Lynn. I, yes, but practically speaking, no, no, that's my sense. That yes, it was considered dishonorable to seduce, uh, to seduce a virgin and not do right by her uh, after you had uh, Im impregnated her, um, even if he didn't marry her, he if he did in fact inherit his father's property, he would have been expected to financially maintain her and her child, presuming it lived, um, and and that would have been that that would have um, mended his reputation somewhat. It was expected that you would financially support your natural children, and. And it would have been a little, you know, old young man going around seducing young women. That's not really good. But practically speaking, he wouldn't have been ostracized from society or anything like that. So, yeah, it did. It did. The under, you know, it did damage your reputation a little bit as a man. But the but that kind of social damage was was much, much less for the for the man involved in illicit sex than mm. for the woman. Yeah. I mean, my 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 historical knowledge is 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 from a later period but certainly if you skipped forward 200 years um he would have actually been less his reputation would have suffered less damage from just sort of not acknowledging her and and maybe sort of doing giving her some money uh, to support her but just not acknowledging her than it would be even if everybody knew it than it would be from marrying her. He'd have caused he'd have caused more scandal and damaged his reputation far more by actually marrying her because she's a much lower class than he is. And so this is why I'm saying, you know, is is Frank maybe is there some good to Frank here? Because he yes, okay, he's keeping it secret for now, but he perhaps has good reason for doing that. And you know, he has he has married her. He has kind of uh risked his reputation to marry her. I could be wrong about that. It could be that like in the 1620s that was not the case but i know certainly we as someone said in the chat we need helen to 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 uh, mm. confirm this but i i know certainly a couple of centuries on he would have actually had a worse time reputation wise if he had if he if he'd been known to marry her so that's that's something to throw in there shall we move on and uh see what see what's going on see what happens next so um so arthur has just agreed to lie to uh, Frank's father, possibly against his inclination, possibly not, but to help young Frank out. He seems to be, in general, doing all he can to help the young couple. Uh, Frank has exited the room, and let's see what happens next. Go thy way, cuckoo. Have I caught the young man? The one trouble, then, is freed. He that will feast at others' cost must be a bold-faced guest and re-enter Winifred in a riding suit. When I have heard the news, all now is safe. The worst part is past, thy lip, wench. And he kisses her. I must bid farewell, for fashion's sake, but I will visit thee suddenly, girl. This was cleanly carried. Ha, huh? must not, Win. Then were my happiness that I in heart repent, I did not bring him the dower of a virginity. Sir, forgive me, I have been much to blame. Had not my lewdness given way to your immoderate waste of virtue, you had not with such eagerness pursued the error of your goodness. Dear, dear Wim, 
I hug this art of thine. It shows how cleanly thou canst beguile. In case occasion serve to practice, it becomes thee. Now we share free scope enough, without control or fear, to interchange our pleasures. We will surfeit in our embraces, wench. Come, tell me, when wilt thou appoint a meeting? What to do? Good, good, to con the lessons of our loves, our secret game. Oh, blush to speak it further, as you're a noble gentleman, forget a sin so monstrous. Tis not gently done to open a cured wound. I know you speak for trial, troth you need not. I for trial, not I, by this good sunshine. Can you name that syllable of good, and yet not tremble to think to what a foul and black intent you use it for an oath? Let me resolve you. If you appear in any visitation that brings not with it pity for the wrongs done to abused Thorny, my kind husband, if you infect mine ear with any breath that is not thoroughly perfumed with sighs for former deeds of lust, may I be cursed, even in my prayers, when I vouchsafe to see or hear you. I will change my life from a loose whore to a repentant wife. Wilt thou turn monster now? Art not ashamed, after so many months, to be honest at last? Away, away, filed. My resolution is built upon a rock. This very day, young Thorny vowed, with oaths not to be doubted, that never any change of love should cancel the bonds in which we are to either bound, of lasting truth. And shall I then, for my part, unfile the sacred oath set on record in heaven's book? Sir Arthur, do not study to add to your lascivious lust the sin of sacrilege, for if you but endeavour by any unchaste word to tempt my constancy, you strive as much in you, you strive as much as in you lies to ruin, a temple hallowed to the purity of holy marriage. I have said enough, you may believe me. Get you to your nunnery. They're freeze in your cold cloister, this is fine. Good angels guide me. Sir, you'll give me leave to weep and pray for your conversion. Yes, away to Waltham. Pox on your honesty. Had you no other trick to fool me? Well, oh, you may want money yet. None that I'll send for to you, for hire of a damnation. When I am gone, think on my just complaint. I was your devil. Oh, be you my saint. And Winifred exits. Go. Go thy ways, as changeable a baggage as ever cousined night. Co as ever cozened night. I'm glad I'm rid of her. Honest. Marry. Hang her. Thorny is my debtor. I thought to have him paid, too. I thought to have paid him, too. But fools have fortune. And Sir Arthur exits and we get to the end of that scene and we'll pause just very briefly because we took quite a, 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 a long, we had quite a long discussion in the last pause, but oh my goodness. Ah. Ah, ah. Eric, you were, you were right to say Sir Arthur had a, had a, had a dodgy vibe about him. <laughs> Turns out this is all a cunning plot. And he is actually the one who's, I, I, obviously Frank has seduced Winifred as well, but I, yes, I, I, I think Sir Arthur probably got in there first, Bryony. Well, or is it all Winifred? <gasps> is it all Winifred? It could Seducing be all Winifred. everybody else and then finding her, her best bed out of it. Yeah. I don't know though. Wouldn't she be better off marrying Sir Arthur if she could? Oh, he wouldn't, but he wouldn't do that. He wouldn't marry no. her. No. So, okay. So she's, she's kind of like, well, We'll, we'll see. Uh, Rachel. No, um, I was just going to say the same thing because uh, what do you call it? The it, it seems that Sir Arthur is not the marrying type. Um, <laughs> kind of, he are. kind of blusters at that. He kind of blusters at her talk about about marriage and things. 
Uh, and I wonder if the note that he ends on, because uh, he's talking about debt and want of money, uh, that if he's going to try and take some financial revenge out against uh, Frank, because he's got, he said he's got a, Frank asked him about that letter to his father, he'll get disinherited. So I wonder if that's going to come up again in relation to this, especially mm -hmm. because he, uh, you know, slut shamed her. There, there's some slut shaming here. Um, you know, when he says, you may want money yet. Uh, and before she said uh, something about a uh, whore. Um, and I think there's some linguistic connection between those two lines. Mm. We, we shall see. He's, I mean, he hasn't actually, he's told Frank he's going to give him this present of money, but he hasn't actually given it to him, has he? So that's kind of looking less and less likely now, but we'll find out. Lois. Yeah, uh, what Sir Arthur said as just after Frank left, he, he called him a cuckoo. Uh, and the thing about the cuckoo, as you, as you know, is that it lays its birds in other people's nests. Uh, I mean, lays its eggs in other people's nests. And that's why it's a symbol of cuckolding. So there's already this sense that uh, uh, I think Sir Arthur may well be thinking that Frank is going to be fathering his, Sir Arthur's child. And, uh, uh, you know, that he's enjoying the whole notion of having kind of trapped him. Yeah, although that did that did puzzle me slightly because he called Frank the cuckoo, yeah. and and in fact but he's the cuckoo. he would be the cuckoo, yeah, yeah. He'd be yeah. The cuckoo. Yeah. But in fact, a cuckolded husband is always called a cuckoo, even ah, though okay. uh, you know it's it's, it's, it's the, they've yeah. kind of inverted it, yeah. Mm. But yeah, yeah, it's it's a terrific opening though, isn't it? I mean, you you, mm. you start worrying about one yeah. thing and then you get a complete surprise in the next scene. It's uh, I mean, and that was I mean, we paused in the middle, but that was all one scene. That was the opening scene of the play. So, I mean, what a fantastic way to kick off. Um, yes, I think I would be, if, if I was a 17th century audience member, I think I would be fully engrossed and probably already on the end of my seat, actually, in spite of the fact that there is no witch as yet and there is no magic as yet, which is what I was expecting. But yeah. uh, we've nevertheless got a very, very pacey and, uh, and fascinating um, set of characters and, and plot. Uh, right. If no one else has anything to say, then we'll we'll push on because uh, we had quite a lot of chat before. We'll go into Act One, Scene Two. Enter <sighs> Old Thorny and Carter. You offer, Master Carter, like a gentleman. I cannot find fault with it. Tis so fair. No gentleman, I, Master Thorny, spare the mastership. Call me by my name, John Carter. Master is a title my father, nor his before him were acquainted with. Honest Hertfordshire, your yeoman. Yeah, such a one as am I. Uh, my word and my deed shall be proved one at all times. I mean to give you no security for the marriage money. How? No security? Although it need not so long as you live, yet who is he has surety of his life one hour? Men, the proverb says, are mortal. Else, for my part, I distrust you not, whether some double. Double, treble, more or less, I tell you, Master Thorny, I'll give no security. Bonds and bills are but terriers to catch fools and keep lazy knaves busy. My security shall be present payment. And we <coughs> hear about Edmonton hold present payment as sure as an alderman's bond in London, Master Thorny. I cry you mercy, sir. I understood you not. I like young Frank well, so does my Susan too. The girl has a fancy to him, which makes me ready in my purse. There be other suitors within that make much noise to little purpose. If Frank loves Sue, Sue shall have none but Frank. Tis some mannerly, mannerly girl, Master Thorny, though but a homely man's daughter. They have worse faces looked out of black bags, man. You speak your mind freely and honestly. I marvel my son comes not. I'm sure he will be here sometime today. Today or tomorrow, when he comes, he shall be welcome to bread, beer, and beef. Yeoman's fair, we have no kickshaws. Full dishes, whole bellyfuls. Should I die in three days at one of the slender city suppers, you might send me to Barber Surgeon's Hall the fourth day to hang out for an anatomy. Here come they that... And enter Warbeck with Susan and Somerton with Catherine. How now, girls, every day play with you. Valentine's Day too, all by couples. 
This thus will young folks do when we are laid in our graves, Master Thorny. Here is all the care they take. <laughs> and how do you find the wenches, gentlemen? Have they any mind to a loose gown and a straight shoe? Win them and wear them. They shall choose for themselves by my, con my consent. You speak like a kind father, Sue. Thou hearest. The liberty that's granted thee. What sayst thou? Wilt thou be mine? Your what, sir? I dare swear never your wife. Canst thou be so unkind, considering how dearly I affect thee? Nay, dote on thy perfections. You are studied too scholar-like in words I understand not. I am too coarse for such a gallant's love as you are. By the honor of gentility. Good sir, no swearing, yea or nay with us. Prevail above o all oaths you can invent. By this white hand of thine. Take a false uh -huh. oath. Fie, fie, flatter the wise, fools regard it. And I of, and one of these am I. Dost thou despise me? Let him talk on, Master Thorny. I know Sue's mind. The fly may buzz about the candle. He's, he shall but cinch his wings when all's done. Frank, Frank is he that has her heart. But shall I live in hope, Kate? Better so than be a desperate man. Perhaps thou thinkst it is thy portion I level at. Wert thou as poor in fortunes as thou art rich in goodness, I would rather be suitor for the dower of thy virtues than twice thy father's whole estate, and prithee, be thou resolved so. Master Summerton, it is an easy labour to deceive a maid that will believe men's subtle promises. Yet I conceive of you as worthily as I presume you to deserve. Which is as worthily in loving thee sincerely as thou art worthy to be so beloved. I shall find time to try you. Do, Kate, do. And when I fail, all my joys forsake me. Or beg and soar at it still. <laughs> I laugh to myself, Master Thorny, to see how earnestly he beats the bush while the bird has flown into another's bosom. <laughs> A very unthrift, Master Thorny. One of the country roaring lads. We, we have such as well in the city, as the city. Such, and as aren't rake hells as they are, though not nim so nimble at their prizes of wit. Sue knows the rascal to inherit breadth and will fit him accordingly. What is the other gentleman? One Summerton, the honester man of the two, by five pound in every stone weight. <laughs> a civil fellow, he is a fine, convenient to state of land in Western by Essex. Master Rangers that dwells by Enfield sent him hither. He likes Kate well. I may tell you, I think she likes him as well. If they agree, I'll not hinder the match for my part, but that Warbeck is such another. I use him kindly for Master Summerton's sake, for he came hither first as a companion of his. Uh, honest man, Master Thorne, he may fall into Knave's company now and then. Three hundred a year jointure, Sue. <laughs> Where lies it? By sea or land? I think by sea. Do I look like a captain? Not a whit, sir. Should all the use of the seas be reckoned captains? Should all that use by the seas be reckoned captains? There's not a ship should have a scullion in her to keep her clean. Do you scorn me, Mistress Susan? Am I a subject to be jeered at? Neither am I a property for you to use as stale to your fond, wanton, loose discourse. Pray, sir, be civil. We'll be angry, wasp. God of mercy, Sue, she'll frick him on my life if he be fumble with her. And enter Frank. Master Francis Thorny, you are welcome indeed. Your father expected your coming. How does the right worshipful knight, Sir Arthur Clarington, your master? In health this morning, sir, my duty. Now you come as I would, I could wish. Frank Thorny, ha! Oh, you must excuse me, sir. Uh, virtuous Mistress Susan, kind Mistress Catherine. And he kisses them both. Gentlemen, uh, to both, good time of the day. The like to you. Tis he. A word, friend. 
on my life, this is the man stands fair and crossing Susan's love to me. I think no less. Be wise and take no notice on it. He that can win her best deserves her. Mary, a serving man, Mew. Prithee, friend, no more. Gentlemen, all oh, there's within a side a slight dinner ready, if you please to taste of it. Master Thorny, Master Francis, Master Somerton, why, girls, what housewives, will you spend your, all your forenoon in tittle tattles? Away! Well, faith, will you go in, gentlemen? We'll follow presently. My son and I have a few words of business. At your pleasure. And exeunt all but old Thorny and Frank. And we'll just uh, pause for a moment there, because again, this is an, a very big scene and there's a lot happening. Uh, so let's just take a moment to recap. So we have old Thorny, who's the father of Frank, and we have Carter, who is this uh, rich yeoman with these two daughters. And um, they're talking about a possible union between uh, Frank and Susan, who apparently love each other. <laughs> or so the fathers think. Um, I can't see anything going wrong with this. <laughs> Can you? <laughs> oh, what do we? What do we think? What, what's What's going on here? What's the What's What's the subtext be beneath all this uh, talk, Lynn? Well, this play is really concerned with um, rank mm -hmm. and wealth and the sort of troubled relationship between those two um, sort of identity markers or status markers, because, you know, Sir, Sir Arthur is so far the ranking individual um, who's also wealthy, so that kind of tracks, but he's not a very good person. Um, and thorny, the thorny family seems to be sort of lower gentry um, and of some material substance. But Carter and his daughters are not gentry. They're commonality, but they've got land and money. Mm. So, uh, you know, so even though Susan is lower ranking than Frank, she's got a dowry to bring to the union. So that's Thorny's interest in that match. So it's this very sort of complex matrix of money and status. And, and when those things don't track, it just creates a lot of complications. So, mm. so the play seems really interested in that. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Rachel um, put a comment in uh, the chat um, earlier asking um, a, a a, a, a sort of side tangent, tangential question about Pride and Prejudice. And it's it's actually so far, this is really reminding me of a, of a, of a Regency romance, actually, or, or, or at least a Regency uh, comedy. You've got all these, um, you've got all these potential matches and you've got, as you say, all this, all this <coughs> rank and hierarchy being sifted out. You know, the man who has the money, but no, um, no class as it were and then and then the people who are born gentry but don't have any money it's this play is not going at all in the direction i expected it to uh lois yeah and one one other just to add to lynn's explanation of the classes it's really odd that warbeck and somerton think that frank is actually beneath them i mean marry a serving man you know because uh, that's where warbeck thinks his his attempt to persuade susan to marry him isn't working and it's because he suspects rightly that she's in love with Frank, but the idea that she would marry a serving man. So it's odd because Frank is, you know, clearly above Winifred in rank and yet uh, uh, he's in this really funny position. I mean, he seems to be totally dependent at the moment on the goodwill of a lot of other people. Yes, he's sort of, um, he, I, I don't know if this phrase was in, uh, in usage at this time, but he strikes me as being a man of business so he's 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 Sir Arthur's man of business in, in that he 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 needs to earn a living and so he's working for Sir Arthur but he's he's from a um, as as some stewards and, and men of business were he's he's actually from quite a uh, a no, well, not a noble background but a gentleman he's a gentleman's son uh, but obviously has doesn't have the money to live a gentleman's life um, so he's yes he's in this. He's in this kind of ambivalent position, isn't he? And he, yes, he seems to 
owe a lot to lots of different people. Warbeck, I assume, I mean, we had all this kind of lovely exposition about who everybody was, which is always helpful. Um, Somerton is obviously a gentleman with his own estate uh, and Warbeck is his friend, but we don't really know much about him other than the fact that Carter isn't terribly keen, thinks he's a knave. So we don't really know what his status is, but yeah, he's certainly willing to look down on um, willing to look down on Frank, presumably because Frank's having to be employed. You know, he's not a gentleman of, he might be a gentleman, but he's not a gentleman of leisure. It's interesting. I was not expecting to have all these conversations about, <laughs> about uh, yeah, rank and, and class and hierarchy in a play called uh, The Witch of Enfield. Uh, not Enfield, Edmonton. Edmonton. Um, so, uh, Ed Enfield, Edmonton. But, but they're very similar. If you don't know the geography, they're kind of right next door to each other. Right, so, um, the old father, well, Carter at least, the father of the daughters has gone, the ladies have gone, and we have Frank left alone <laughs> with his father. Let's pick up there and see what they say when everyone else has left the room. I think you guessed the reason, Frank, for which I sent for you. Uh, yes, sir. I need not tell you what, with what a labyrinth of dangers daily the best part of my whole estate's encumbered, nor have I any clue to wind it out. But what occasion proffer, proffers me, wherein if you should falter, I shall have the shame and you the loss. On these two points rely our happiness or ruin. If you marry with wealthy Carter's daughter, there's a portion will free my land, all which I will instate upon the marriage to you. Otherwise, I must be of necessity enforced to make a present sale of all. And yet, for aught I know, live in as poor distress or worse than now I do. You hear, hear the sum? I told you thus before. Have you considered on it? Uh, I have, sir. And... However, I could wish to enjoy the benefit of single freedom, for that I find no disposition in me to undergo the burden of that care that marriage brings with it, yet uh, to secure and settle the continuance of your credit, I humbly yield to be directed by you in all commands. You have already used such driving protestations to the maid that she is wholly yours, and, speak the truth, you love her, do you not? For pity, sir, I should deceive her. Better you'd been unborn. But is your love so steady that you mean, nay, more, desire to make her your wife? Else, sir, it were a wrong not to be righted. True, it were. And you will marry her? Heaven prosper it, I do intend it. Oh, thou art a villain, a devil like a man. Wherein have I offended all the powers so much to be father to such a graceless, godless son? To me, sir, this? Oh, my cleft heart. To thee, son of my curse, speak truth and blush, thou monster. Hast thou not married Winifred, a maid was fellow servant with thee? Some swift spirit has blown this news abroad. I must outface it. Do you study for excuse? Why, all the country is full on it. With your license, tis not charitable. I'm sure it is not fatherly. So much to be or swayed with credulous conceit of mere impossibilities. <laughs> but fathers are privileged to think and talk at pleasure. Why? Canst thou yet deny thou hast no wife? What do you take me for, an atheist? One that nor hopes the blessedness of life hereafter, neither fears the vengeance due to such as make the marriage bed an inn, which travellers day and night after a toilsome lodging leave at pleasure? Am I become so insensible of losing the glory of creation's work, my soul? Oh, I have lived too long. Thou hast, dissembler, darest thou persevere yet, and pull down wrath as hot as flames of hell to strike thee quick into the grave of horror? 
I believe thee not. Get from my sight. Sir, though mine innocence needs not a stronger witness than the clearness of an unparished conscience, yet for that I was informed how mainly you had been possessed of this untruth, to quit all scruple, please you, peruse this letter. It is to you. From whom? Sir Arthur Clarington, my master. Well, sir. And old Thorny reads the letter. Side, I am distracted and waded deeper into mischief than virtue can avoid. But on I must. Fate leads me. I will follow. There you read what may confirm you. Yes, and wonder at it. Forgive me, Frank. Credulity abused me. My tears express my joy, and I'm sorry I injured innocence. Alas, I knew your rage and grief proceeded from your love to me, so I conceived it. My good son, I'll bear with many faults in thee hereafter. Bear thou with mine. Uh, the peace is soon concluded. Re-enter Carter and Susan. And do we have Carter? Yeah, sorry, this is my script uh, acting up a bit. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Why, Master Thorny, do you took out why, Master Thorny, do you mean to talk out your dinner? The company attends your coming. What must it be, Master Frank, or son Frank? I am plain Dunstable. Son, brother, if your daughter like to have it so. I dare be confident she is not altered from what I left her at our parting last. Are you, fair maid? We cannot hear you, daughter. Are you? Uh, I can't. <laughs> you took too sure possession of an engaged heart. Which now I challenge. Marion, much good maid, do thee, son, take her to thee. Get me a brace of boys as a brother, Frank. The nursing shall not stand thee in a penny worth of milk. Reach her home and spare not. When's the day? Tomorrow, if you please. To use ceremony of charge and custom were to little purpose. Their loves are married fast enough already. A good motion. Will he have them? Will he have a household dinner and let the fiddlers go scrape? Let the bride and bridegroom dance at night together, no matter for the guests. Tomorrow soon, tomorrow. Shall us the dinner now? We are on all sides pleased, I hope. Pray heaven I may deserve the blessing sent me, now my heart is settled. So is mine. Your marriage money shall be received before your wedding shoes can be pulled on. Blessing on you both. No man can hide his shame from heaven that views him. In vain he flees whose destiny pursues him. And excellent Frank, and that's the end of the scene. Oh, what a tangled oh. web we weave. <laughs> oh, ho, ho, ho. Oh, so I was. Oh, what a mess. Yes, <laughs> indeed. A mess indeed. I was desperately trying to get you to have some sympathy for Frank early on. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out that, yes, he is indeed uh, a conniver and a finagler of the, of the highest order. Um, yeah. his, his father wants him to marry Susan, uh, the, the daughter of the rich uh, yeoman Carter, in order to save the, the family estate. And rather than saying, oh, I'm actually married to someone else already, or, or just saying maybe, no, I'm not sure about this, he just goes, yeah, okay, I'll marry her, that's fine, tomorrow, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Lois, then uh, Lynn, then Bryony. I mean, not only that, but he's clearly been courting Susan already. I mean, the way he talked just now. Uh, so he's been, you know, two timing these women. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, exactly. He, the one gets the sense that this um, engagement was at least informally settled before he went into service and moved into to to um, Arthur's house, to Sir Arthur's house. So 
he kind of had a girl when he started his affair with Winifred. And you've, you, you've got to think that he also knew that his father's estate was mortgaged to the hilt and it, it, and was not, he wasn't really free to inherit it. That, 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 so he's kind of been lying to Arthur and Winifred about his prospects too. He, he couldn't not have known that the estate was mortgaged, right? Yeah, I, d so, I don't know. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, question because he, yeah. he, he did he did seem to be fairly confident when he was talking to Winifred that he yeah. was going to inherit. Now he could have been lying, but I, he, I don't know. He seemed yeah, well, he seems to be feeling quite smug about that. So I I, I don't know. But, yeah. but it's a really interesting point, and I guess it would be open to interpretation in a in a production. Yeah. Uh, right, I saw a lot of hands, but yeah. Bryony is, is Frank when his yeah when his father says, you know, I'm going to have to sell everything. Like, does Frank go, oh shit? You know, does he have a mm. a reaction? Mm. Might, might but the, the other thing I observed it. about this scene is like, I I I I have to enjoy the way that this is written because Frank never actually lies. He never says, yeah. oh, I'm not married. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, oh yeah. no, that's not true. He, he basically yeah. says, how could you believe that about me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. very cleverly. Written. Yes, yeah. he is a master of deceit. Uh, Bryony. There was a line that I didn't I, I didn't quite get and I wondered if it was was it a shred of conscience or what on Frank's behalf when he says to her pity sir I should deceive her. Uh, is that is he acknowledging that he has talked his way right into her knickers slash marriage bed or yeah or is it a, a hint of conscience I, I couldn't quite work out the tone of that bit well i got the impression because he's talking to his father and this is early on in the conversation as well i i had the impression that he was saying that um as a sort of way of agreeing with his father in a way that made him appear so that he's saying to his father oh yes of course because i am such an honorable young man yeah, I, I, that's how i read it but i mean it is am ambiguous for certain uh, there could be other interpretations um rachel and then Elizabeth. I mean, this scene kind of like changes the whole perception of that first scene, especially like the technicalities that he's using when talking to his father and, and you know, not saying, oh, no, I'm not married. You know, um, that that fine line of uh, what do you call it? Telling half truths instead of a lie. Um, he kind of does that same, he's, he's kind of doing that same thing to Winifred back then, mm. uh, you know, telling her where she's going to live and, you know, how often, um, he's going to come and he's playing it, he's playing it in this way, not saying that if he doesn't marry this other woman, that's what's going to disinherit him and, and making it sound like, um, it's his father and bringing up his father's love and, you know, there, there's so much I think to you can mine out of that first scene again coming um to this one yeah. um and so much yeah there, there's so much here I, I'm I'm so enjoying this last scene and and so far I mean we have another scene left but I'm I'm really enjoying all of this so far yeah the, the character construction is absolutely uh fantastic the way it's all all building one scene upon the other um Lois yeah, just that I mean, we're, we're mostly naturally focusing on Fra Frank's an incredibly elaborate set of lies and half truths and evasions, but uh, he still doesn't know that he is, in fact, the dupe of Sir Arthur, who mm. is deceiving him. I mean, mm. the whole thing, you know, it's even more complicated. Yes, there's layers upon layers. It's, it's, it's really uh, uh, very deft. I, I like uh, Rachel, I'm enjoying it uh, immensely too. I am, however, quite surprised that we've got to the end of sorry eric did i see a hand there uh, yeah i was just gonna say that it's interesting that like susan has been i i don't know how long she and her presumably sister catherine have been like warding off the the, the um attentions of warbeck and somerton i, I think catherine is act actually like somerton so you know that might not be problematic but then sort of Susan seems to be more, you know, ooh, Frank, Frank, and, you know, that kind of thing. But then kind of, it just seems interesting to think, like, how long has she been sort of messing around and telling him, oh, yes, go do this and go do that. And then, you know, eventually bugger off. Yeah, she certainly, she, 
she tells him how it is in in no uncertain terms which makes me think that she said this to him before the fact that she's so like i mean it could be that she's just a very plain and uh uh, uh direct speaking uh uh woman i mean she, you know her, her father says that he is he's a very plain and direct man so maybe she's uh, her father's daughter but it did strike me the fact that she was just so very direct with him made me think oh she's had this conversation with him before and she's just getting really really you know crabby mm -hmm. about the fact that he keeps on you know quite rightly so keeps on um attempting to woo her when she's really not interested but again that's something that you could uh you could speculate on in a in a production um yes uh elizabeth sorry elizabeth yeah. i meant to come to you earlier and then i didn't Oh, that's fine. Um, I definitely agree with you and Rachel about the text so far. My question, I had a bit of a question, a bit of concerns about the land that mm. the Thornies own, because the Thornies seem to have a lot of land. Mm. But if um, Frank, Frank marries Susan, his father said he'll apportion him a small amount of it to be his inheritance. And I just wondered why his father wouldn't give him the whole lot. Um, well, that's a good question. And again, I feel we need a historian in the room, but I think was 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 not the implication that he would, that he would give him a small amount now. Oh. Uh, once he once he paid off the debt, once he had Susan's um, dowry, once he'd married Susan and had her dowry, he would be able to then pay off the debt on the land and he would give Frank a small portion of it now uh, and then presumably with the intention being that he would inherit the rest after his father's death yeah. that was how I interpreted that but I could be wrong if anyone else has got any um, different interpretations on that no okay right um, yes the, I am enjoying this play immensely this is exactly my kind of play however it is not at all uh, the kind of play I thought it was going to be <coughs> whatsoever um, we haven't had it's called uh, the witch of Edmonton we haven't had any witching yet we haven't had anything remotely spooky however <laughs> we are now going to move into act two scene one which begins with enter mother Sawyer gathering sticks and why on me? Why should the envious world throw all their scandalous malice upon me? Because I am poor, deformed, and ignorant, and like a bow buckled and bent together by some more strong in mischiefs than myself. Must I for that be made a common sink for all the filth and rubbish of men's tongues to fall and run into? Some call me witch and being ignorant of myself, they go about to teach me how to be one, urging that my bad tongue, by their bad usage made so, forespeaks their cattle, doth bewitch their corn, themselves their servants and their babes at nurse. Thus they enforce upon me, and in part make me to credit it. And here comes one of my chief adversaries. And enter old Banks. Out, out upon thee, witch. Just call me witch. I do, witch, I do. And worse I would, I knew a name more hateful. What makes thou upon my ground? Gather a few rotten sticks to warm me. Down with them when I bid thee quickly. I'll make thy bones rattle in thy skin else. <laughs> you won't churl, cutthroat, miser. There they be. And would she they throws them down. Sorry. Would they stuck across thy throat, thy bowels, thy maw, thy midriff? Sayest me thou so hag out of my ground. And he oh. beats her. Oh, dost strike me, slave, curmudgeon. Now thy bones ache, thy joints cramp, and convulsions stretch and crack thy sinews. Bro, cursing thou hag, take that and that. He beats her and th then exits. Strike, do, and withered may that hand and arm whose blows have lamed me drop from the rotten trunk. Abuse me, beat me, call me hag and witch. What is the name? 
where and by what art learned, what spells, what charms or invocations may the thing called familiar be purchased? Enter Cuddy Banks and several other clowns. A new head for the table and silver tippings for the pipe. Remember that and forget not five leash of new bells. Double bells, crooked lane. Ye shall have them straight in crooked lane, double bells all, if it be possible. Double bells, double coxcombs, trebles, buy me trebles, all trebles, for our purpose is to be in the altitudes. All trebles? Not a mean? Not one. The more it is so cast, we'll have neither mean nor base in our company, fellow Roland. What? N nor a counter? By no means. No hunting counter. Leave leave that to Enfield Chase men. All trebles. All the altitudes. Now, for the disposing of parts in Amoris, little or no labour will serve. If you that be minded to follow your leader know me, an ancient honour belonging to our house, for a four-horse, in the team and four gallant in a Morris, my father's stable is not unfurnished. So much for the four horse, but how for a good hobby horse? <laughs> for an hobby horse, let me see an almanac. Midsummer moon, let me see ye. When the moon is in full, then wits in the wane. <laughs> no more. Use your best skill. You, your Morris will suffer an eclipse. Eps. A strange one. Strange? Yes, and most sudden. Remember the four gallant and forget the hobby horse. The whole body of your Morris will be darkened. There will be of us, uh, but tis no matter. Forget the hobby horse. Cuddy Banks, have you forgot since he paced it from Enfield Chase to Edmonton? Cuddy, honest Cuddy, cast thy stuff. Suffer me ye all. It shall be known I can take my knees as well as another man. Seek your hobby horse where you can get him. Cuddy, honest Cuddy, we confess and are sorry for our neglect. The old horse shall have a new bridle. The caparison's newly painted. The tail repaired, the snaffle and the bosses new saffron doer. Find. Honest. Loving and ingenious, affable cuddy. Now, to show I am not flint, but affable, as you say, very well stuffed, a kind of warm dough or puff paste, I relent. I connive, most affable Jack. Let the hobby horse provide a strong back. He shall not want a belly when I am in him. But... And he sees Mother Sawyer. Odds me, Mother Sawyer. The old witch of Edmonton, if our mirth be not crossed. Bless us, Cuddy, and let her curse t'other eye out. What dost now? Ungirt, unblessed, says the proverb, but my girdle shall serve for a riding knot and a fig for all the witches in Christendom. What wouldst thou? The devil cannot abide to be crossed. And scorns to come at any man's whistle. Away with the witch. Away, Away with, with the, the witch, witch of Edmonton. And exeunt in strange postures. Still vexed, still tormented. That curmudgeon Banks is crowned of all my scandal. I am shunned and hated like a sickness made a scorn to all degrees and sexes. I have heard old Beldam's talk of familiars in the shape of mice, rats, ferrets, weasels, and I what not what, that have appeared and sucked, some say, their blood. But by what means they came acquainted with them, I am now ignorant. Would some power, good or bad, instruct me which way I might be revenged upon this churl? I'd go out of myself 
and give this fury leave to dwell within this ruined cottage ready to fall with age, abjure all goodness, be at hate with prayer and study curses, imprecations, blasphemous speeches, oaths, detested oaths, or anything that's ill, so I might work revenge upon this miser, this black cur that barks and bites and sucks the very blood of me and of my credit. Tis all one to be a witch as to be counted one. Vengeance, shame, ruin, light upon that canker. Oh, and we'll just take a moment to pause there. Um, so finally, we've met the witch. What do we think of her? Do we do it? Yeah. Yeah, Rachel's giving her the thumbs up. What, what, I, 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 I'm actually quite thinking she's, she's all right, this witch. She's, she seems to be, uh, you know, pretty put upon. And I, I have quite a lot of sympathy for her. Uh, what, do, what do other people think? Uh, Eric, uh, then Lynn, then Bryony. Uh, yeah, she sort of fits the, like, I, I, I did a project on witches a few years ago, and um, it was kind of, like, she kind of fits the demographic of people who would be identified as witches, sort of, um, you know, someone who basically, oh, yeah, you can totally tell, look like, you know, tell if she looks like a witch kind of thing, or um, someone who's ignorant, who's a woman, uh, who is um, basically an outcast for one reason or another and yeah mm. yeah i mean what you said there about like she she fits the the demographic i mean that's that's uh us or rather you looking back at it uh with 21st century eyes but to actually find this kind of um character in a play of 1621 um you know where where the playwrights seem to be um aware of that demographic and the injustice of it at this time i i, I seems to be quite extraordinary uh, now i think i said uh, lynn next and then bryony and then rachel yeah basically exactly what eric and you have said sarah that i can't name my source but it's it's it it, it was named in a, in a lecture series i've listened to a number of times about this period that um yeah this is really typical of what we see in the in the record that Usually, an older widowed woman who has has n none or a very slender means of supporting herself, who basically relies on the charity of her neighbors, makes everyone really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. They don't really have a lot to spare, so they say no a lot. They feel guilty. She kind of curses them under her breath. A week later, a month later, a year later, somebody dies or somebody's farm animal dies it's like oh it must have been that curse that that old lady uh muttered under her breath when she was leaving our house empty-handed so yeah this is actually part of a pattern but as you say it's very interesting that these that this this text the writers of this text have perceived that to be a problem it the text will, we will see does not deny that witchcraft is real but the observation that tis all one to be a witch as to be counted one that's really quite a damnation of the the sort of community that they create witches by assuming someone is one when she's not mm. very interesting mm. Mm. yeah uh Bryony. yeah there was there was a so much different opinion going around at the time about witches and you know various books being published about what makes a witch how to try a witch all that kind of stuff going on and essentially being a woman and spending a lot of time on your own are two of the main things really that that led to it um but then also if you had a modicum of intelligence and you were you know maybe quite good at herb law and things and actually if as long as as long as it's working for people then great you're you know you're a, a wise woman but as soon as somebody's not happy with you you're a witch straight away so she's a real social pariah um, but i think it's very interesting that we've got these 
normal people within society who are behaving so despicably, dishonorably. There's we've had mentions of devils and things already, which you know that is usually which is where we're seen as communicating with the devil and stuff. So yeah, like you say, they've they've made a, a conscious decision, which is very unusual for the time. I think you know that they're almost comparing are are these people as bad as as this mm -hmm. person yeah it's quite nice to see that yeah it is because we have such a contrast with the previous act which was all like uh set in this very um in this world of manners uh where you had you know um uh, alliances being forged and uh and uh, hierarchies being maintained and and actually nobody was well no there are there are a couple of people susan Susan was okay. We're st the the jury's still out on Winifred, but um, but it but in general, everybody seemed to have a an angle, and everyone was behaving fairly despicably to one degree or another, uh, and yet she is the witch. And I also just want to flag up the fact that um, it's her physical appearance too, uh, which I think you know is something that uh, again speaks so directly to a modern audience because you know it's fine for a woman to be old, uh, provided she's still kind of comely or neat. Or, or whatever but because she's you know she says she's well, mis misshapen in some way presumably she's got arthritis poor woman um you know that that immediately you know if you're not um you know pleasing to look at that that's a, a, another black mark against you uh rachel you had your hand up earlier and then uh lois oh um i don't know i think there's so many things uh to say about this um uh, I remember when we were talking about another play, there was talks about the deserving and the undeserving poor. And even if this is coming uh, after, if this play is, I'm, I'm assuming is being written, you know, later on, but you might still have a generation, uh, that generation with that concept alive or something. Um, uh, and, and this idea of a social safety net that doesn't exist <clears throat> um, and how many people would fall through something that didn't exist and have to rely on the charity of their neighbors. And also, um, uh, you know, the sexism, uh, you know, of this, of, of an older woman, uh, you know, that I feel like in other plays that we've gotten, older women have been jokes. And this one is, is you know, you know, she, we know she's been made the butt of jokes and she tells us, um, but we get a, 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 a finally like a serious um, perspective from someone like this. And the, I, I don't know about fiction writing, but from like the Salem witch trials, I know what ended them was, um, the sheriff who drove a lot of it was uh, he was take, trying to take lands and money from unpopular people in the town. And a lot of the people that were targeted were wealthy, but they didn't go to the church or something like that. And there were like poorer people like Tichiba, um, who was enslaved by one of the people who was also targeted. And she was an older woman and she was, um, you know, she 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 knew like medicines and she had a different religion and things like that but there was a lot of um you know so there was that tar that religious target you know that maybe she's not a uh, going to church all the time and giving money to the church uh or you know a med you know she's doing a medicine woman a, a midwife or something um what was i going to say oh but the a lot of the rich people the sheriff was taking money from them and it stopped because someone accused the governor's wife and he said that it was enough. So mm. what I'm trying to say is that I think there were rational people that knew that this was a lot of um, something, but they used people's ignorance and religion to um, take advantage of people with less education or less money. Uh, and she's, I think she's having this discussion and there's, I think on the playwrights behalves, they're uh, kind of like how Johnson and one of his was giving us uh, his philosophy of writing. I think Johnson or Decker or Rowley is giving them, they're giving us their philosophy on, um, you know, the nonsense of, of 
witch, witch hunts and the sexism and all the, you know, classism of it too. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I really like the point you made there about the fact that, you know, people will spin a big lie um, in order to get, uh, you know, power or, or, or money or whatever it is they're, they're after. And uh, yeah, there are no parallels at all with what's going on in the world today with that. Uh, it is extraordinary, though, to, uh, to to find three playwrights raising these issues in 1621, especially when you think, uh, you know, James I was still on the throne at this point, and he was obsessed with witches. And he'd published books about them, and he'd persecuted a lot of people. So this is actually, you know, within that context, you could maybe see this as, as, as a, a possibly quite a brave play. Uh, Lois. Yeah, I mean, James's attitude to witches, I think, probably was variable. I mean, he definitely believed that witches had attempted to create a storm to, I think, kill him and Anne of Denmark. When, you know, he sailed to Denmark to bring her back to, to Scotland, in fact, when he married her. And there, there were huge storms at sea, which were supposedly caused by witches at Berwick. And he certainly did believe in them. And he did publish a, a book called Demonology. But I think he also... Um, attended various trials and in a couple of cases I think where somebody was claiming to have demonic possession he he found ways of uh, um, of exposing them as fakes you know he, uh, mm -hmm. he he sort of he, he definitely saw himself as a kind of the uh, you know the great Sherlock Holmes of his time and uh, and sometimes he was actually on what we would call the side of rationality so it's a bit of both um, but I, I did want to I mean, we, we didn't really look at all at the, the, the business of Cuddy and the clowns. And it's really odd, you know, the witch comes on, she has this speech about how horribly everybody treats her and, and uh, uh, the, the confrontation with Banks. And then we have these guys all talking about their Morris dance. And I wasn't sure if everybody could figure out what's going on there even because, you know, clearly um, Cuddy gets sort of insulted. I think that line about forgetting the hobby horse, I mean, that is actually a proverb, the hobby horse is forgot. I mean, it's, it's yeah. quoted in various places. You can probably think of at least one. And, uh, and then they apparently had forgotten it and then they all have to apologize to Cuddy because apparently he plays the hobby horse in the Morris dance. And so they've got to realize oh. how important this is. And then when they see her, uh, they all try to figure out ways of fending off her evil eye. I think that's what they're doing. And uh, because, you know, Cuddy says, ungirt, unblessed, says the proverb. I mean, to be girt is to have a belt or a rope or something around your middle. But my girdle shall serve for a riding knot and a fig for all the witches in Christendom. And then, uh, and then the other one says, the devil cannot abide to be crossed. So it's presumably, I don't know, maybe doing that. And then, and scorns to come at any man's whistle. Maybe somebody whistles because it says the exeunt in strange postures. Yeah. So we have a really weird scene here, you know, with mm. uh, something that's sort of a comic version of the way that the, the old guy has been treating her. And mm. uh, they all go out doing yeah. whatever they think is going to ward off her mm. horrible powers. Mm. I, I mean, I wondered as well. Uh, I, 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 I have no idea. You will probably know better than me, Lois, about this. But uh, clowns are quite often, um, they seem to me to be the sort of... Um, the, you know, they are the fringe characters within a play. They are the lowest of the low, almost. Um, yeah. And so the very fact that you have here a group of clowns who are then ostracizing her, I thought that was quite an interesting, um, I thought it was interesting that he picked clowns for this, for this yeah. scene, because although it's like a little moment of light entertainment, yeah, the fact that the clown, even the, even the clowns are ostracizing her and shunning her m m made me just think, well, yes, this is, she is really as, as, uh, as, as far out of society as she possibly can be pushed. I'll go back to Lois and then Eric. Yeah, I mean, clown here means countryman, I think, because they're clearly not all that poor. I mean, one of them says, uh, you know, um, for a four horse, horse in the team and four gallant in a Morris, mm. my father's stable is not unfurnished. True. I mean, he, mm. he seems to be pretty well off. Mm. Mm. True. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I was just going to say the exit in strange postures that just made me think of like a modern equivalent would be like voguing. Yes, I know. <laughs> like sort of really, really bad voguing or something, yes. which would be, yeah. Yeah, no, you could certainly do it that way. Elizabeth. Yeah, um, I think some of the points that have been made about witchcraft 
and the concept of sort of almost female power in um, in the text have been really, really interesting and fascinating. I particularly like the lines where it says um, that my bad tongue by their bad usage made so, for speaks their cattle, doth bewitch their corn, themselves their servants and their babes at nurse. And that's the kind of impact that her, that her power seems to have and the reach that it has. But I also thought it was interesting how there's violence against her immediately. Mm. And that violence against her, I was wondering if that is supposed to be comic, if it's supposed to be funny, because she gets beaten at the beginning. Mm. Um, and then there's the sense of her being this hag, being this sort of ugly, ugly um, thing that, that's not almost human, that she's subhuman in some ways. And I thought that that was quite a modern notion of what a witch is supposed to be. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Well, because yeah. she's, she's sort of the... Um, yeah, she's kind of portrayed as subhuman and yet she's given right at the top of the act a, a very human voice and a very eloquent voice as well. I mean, how did other people find this? We, we, we can't spend too long on this because we need to press on. But like I personally was fairly appalled by the beating. Uh, it didn't, you know, sometimes when clowns are beaten, you're supposed to find it funny, although I don't tend to. But um, with this, I there was none of that. I really felt that this was quite a a, 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 a grim thing i felt this was a real ordeal that she was going through uh but what did other people think lynn i saw your hand yeah the like is this comedy violence or is this supposed to be mm. actually disturbing violence that's a really good question because beating people is often supposed to be funny in this mm. family and further back you know punch and judy domestic violence is hilarious yeah mm. um uh, so I don't, I don't know. The tone, the question of tone is really, it's really interesting. Um, I did want to kind of go back to the whole the witchcraft and what did people think about witchcraft as far back as the 1580s, which is when what 40 years before this, a man named Reginald Scott published uh, a book called The Discovery, meaning the unveiling of the uncovering of witchcraft. It was basically entirely skeptical where he, well, I'll just read to you from Wikipedia. He set himself to prove that the belief in witchcraft and magic was rejected by reason and by religion and that the spiritualistic manifestations were willful impostures or illusions due to mental disturbance in the observers. So he associated the belief in witchcraft with superstition and Catholicism and basically saying it's all nonsense. Mm. But, and that was 1584. But as you know, as Lois was saying, James the first rejected that the claims of that book and wrote his own demonology and saying, no, some of it's fake, but some of it's real. So there, you know, this debate has been going on for a while. In, indeed it has. Uh, um, Brian, I see your hand. Lois, did you have something that you wanted to say specifically in relation to uh, Lynn's point? Well, uh, yeah, I've I've read a lot of uh, Reginald Scott's book. It's also rather interesting. Oh, cool. there's, there's some lovely diagrams in it of how to perform magic tricks because he's also showing you how things that people thought were done by witchcraft and magic can really be done by you know a competent conjurer. Mm. Uh, so it's a it's a very interesting book from that point of view too. Excellent, Bryony. Yeah, just on the beatings thing, I yeah. wonder whether they were using something which was such an ingrained trope at the time, the, the hilarious beating of a comic servant, whether they were using it, in, whether they're presenting it in a way that is designed to make the audience just think themselves hang on mm. should I be laughing at this mm. and I think maybe that's that I, I don't know whether or not that's just me looking at the whole thing with modern eyes mm. but that kind of seems to be the tone of the play as well you know just we've not been told which is a good or bad we've not been told these people are good or bad but the, the actions that we're seeing yeah. that we can judge them on you know for with modern eyes we, we're not really agreeing with them and thinking that the witch is the bad person in this story. Yeah, no, absolutely, I agree. I mean, there's certainly, as Lynn said, the the question of tone. I I I can see this, um, you know, chiming with a modern audience uh, very very well, just because it is all there, and um, whether it's intentionally there or not. I mean, we can't we can't know. We can speculate, but we can't know. But it 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 does seem to be there that the 
that uh, that that theme does seem to be there. Uh, Rachel, very quickly, then we must move on. The um, parallel between Sawyer and Winifred. I mean, Winifred, I'm assuming is very young. She has at least two suitors, um, uh, reliant on men. Sawyer doesn't have that ability to rely on um, men anymore. They don't find her physically attractive, I'm assuming from whatever. And I'm assuming she, I mean, she's an older woman. Um, just the contrast and the foil of that but how they are both similarly reliant, reliant on men and it, one has that and the other is lacking it. Mm. Um, and the talk about that, how, mm. um, you know, desirability as power is not really power. Um, mm. And they're both very um, weak positions that Winifred and Sawyer are in um, socially. Mm. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really uh, nice point. Uh, and you, you could even uh, take that further in a production by maybe echoing a little bit of the, the costume or something or the visual between Winifred and uh, Sawyer to you know see the other the, the opposite ends of the the spectrum but yes uh, neither of them have any power right we must press on uh, so so far we have this um, uh, blesser this this very put upon very very demonized um, uh, old woman but we haven't actually had any demons as yet however enter a black dog oh have i heard thee cursing thou art my own thine what art thou he that thou hast so often importuned to appear to thee the devil bless me the devil Come, do not fear. I love thee too much, too well to hurt or fright thee. If I seem terrible, it is to such as hate me. I have found thy love unfeigned. I have seen and pitied thine open wrongs, and come out of my love to give thee just revenge against thy foes. May I believe thee? To confirm it, command me do any mischief unto man or beast, and I'll effect it on a condition that uncompelled thou make a deed of and gift, a, a deed of gift of soul and body to me. Oh, to alas, my soul and body. And that instantly, and seal it with thy blood. If thou deniest, I'll tear thy body in a thousand pieces. Oh, I know not where to seek relief, but, but shall I, after such covenants sealed, see full revenge on all that wrong me? Ha <laughs> silly woman, the devil is no such liar to us such as he loves. Did, didst ever know or hear the devil a liar to us such as he affects? Then I am thine, at least so much of me as I can call mine own. Equivocations, art mine or no? Speak or I'll tear. Uh, all, all thine. Seal it with thy blood. She pricks her arm, which she sucks. Thunder and lightning. See, now I dare call thee that mine. For a proof, command me instantly, I'll run to my mischief. Goodness can I none. And I desire as little. There's an old churl, one banks. That wronged thee, lame, they called thee witch. The same. First upon him I'll be revenged. Thou shalt do, but name how. Go, touch his life. I cannot. Hast thou not vowed? Go, kill the slave. I will not. I cancel then my gift. <laughs> Dost laugh. Why <laughs> wilt not kill him? Fool, because I cannot. Though we have power, no, it is circumscribed and tied in limits. Though he be cursed to thee, yet of himself he's loving to the world and charitable to the poor. Now men that as he love goodness, though in smallest measure live without compass of our reach. His cattle and corn I'll kill and mildew, but his life, until I take him as I late found thee, cursing and swearing, I've no power to touch. Work on his corn and cattle then. I shall, the witch of Edmonton shall see his fall. If she at last put credit in my power and in mine only, make a reasons to me and none but me. Say how and in what manner? 
I'll tell thee, when thou wishest ill, corn, man, or beast, thou wouldst spoil or kill, turn thy back against the sun, and mumble this short orison. If thou to death or shame pursue them, sancti becetur nomen tum. If thou to death or shame pursue them, sancti becetur nomen tum. Perfect. Farewell. Our first made promises will put in execution against banks. And the dog exits. On terminator nomen tuum. <laughs> I'm an expert scholar. Speak Latin or I know not well what language as well as the best of them. Who comes here? Re-enter Cuddy Banks. Son of my worst foe. To death pursue him, et sancti begum nomen tuum. What's that she mumbles? A devil's paternoster? Would it were else? A mother Sawyer, good morrow. Ill morrow to thee, and all the world that flout a poor old woman. To death pursue him, et sancti begum nomen tuum. Nay, good grammar, Sawyer, what e'er it please my father to call you, I know you are. A witch. A witch? Oh, would you were else in faith? Yeah, your father knows I am by this. I would he did. And so in time may you. I would I my else, but witch or no witch, you are a motherly woman, and though my father be a kind of, God bless us, as they say, I have an earnest suit to you, and if you'll be so kind to can me one good turn, I'll be so courteous as to cob you another. Ah, what's that? To spurn, beat me, and call me witch as your kind father doth? Oh, my father, I am ashamed to own him. If he has hurt the head by credit, that's there's money to buy thee a plaster. And he gives her money. A, a small courtesy I would require at thy hand. Ooh, you seem a good young man, and I must dissemble the better to accomplish my revenge. Uh, but uh, for this silver, what wouldst have me do? Uh, bewitch thee? No, by no means. I am bewitched already. I would have thee so good as to unwitch me, or witch another with me for company. I understand thee not. Be plain, my son. As a pike staff for mother. You know Kate Carter? The wealthy yeoman's daughter? What of her? That same part he hath bewitched me. Bewitched thee? Bewitched me. Hiske Arabas. I saw the, a little devil fly out of her eye like a burr bolt, which sticks at this hour up to the feathers in my heart. Now, my request is to send one of thy what do you call them, either to pluck that out or to stick another as fast in hers. Do, and here's my hand, I am thine for three lives. We shall have sport. And thou art in love with her. Up to the very hilts, mother. And thou wouldst have me make her love thee too. I think she'll prove a witch in earnest. Yes, I could find it in my heart to strike her three quarters deep in love with me too. Dost thou think that I can do it and I alone? Truly, mother, which I do verily believe so. And when I see it done, I shall be half persuaded so too. Ah, it is enough. What art can do, be sure of. Turn to the west and Whatsoe'er thou hearst or seest, stand silent and be not afraid. She stamps on the ground. The dog appears and fawns and leaps upon her. Afraid, mother witch. Turn my face to the west. I said I should always have a back friend of her, and now it's out. And her little devil should be hungry. Come sneak in behind me like a cowardly catchpole and clap his talons on my haunches. Tis woundy cold, sure. I dutter and shake like an aspen leaf every joint of me. Scandal and disgrace pursue him, 
at uh, Sanctificator Nomen Tuum. Exit the dog. Oh, now, my son, how is it? Scarce a clean life, Mother Witch. But did your goblin and you spout Latin together? A uh, kind of charm I work by. Uh, didst thou hear me? <laughs> I heard I know not the devil what what mumble in a scurvy bass tone, like a drum that had taken cold in the head, the last muster. Very comfortable words. What were they? And who taught them you? A great learned man. Learned man. Learned devil it was as soon. But what? What comfortable news about the party? Oh, Kate Carter, I'll tell thee. Thou knowest the style at the west end of thy father's peas field. Be there tomorrow night after sunset, and the first live thing thou seest be sure to follow, and that shall bring thee to thy love. In the peas field, has she a mind to coddlings already? The first living thing I meet, you say, shall bring me to her. To a sight of her, I mean. Uh, she will seem wantonly coy and flee thee, but follow her close and boldly. Do but embrace her in thy arms once, and she is thine own. At the stile at the west end of my father's peas land, the first thing I see, follow and embrace her, and she shall be thine. Nay, and I come to embracing once, she shall be mine. I'll go near to make at eaglet else. And Cuddy Banks exits. A ball well bandied. Now the set's half won. The father's wrong, I'll wreak upon the son. And exit oh. Mother Sawyer. And also, that's the end of the scene. <laughs> oh, well, my goodness. Um, Gosh, that, that, that took a turn. Um, uh, Brian, is that a half a hand I see? Yes. <laughs> yeah, my, my sympathy for Sawyer diminished really rapidly at the end there when she <laughs> put out this really rapey sounding plan yeah. all to mess with some guy. Like, where where is the sisterhood and femininity in that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I do, I do wonder with this plan, though, like... Um, I, I, I do wonder if, she, if there's actually a plan or whether she's just like, oh, yeah, go and meet her in the peace field and, uh, it'll, yeah, it's all going to work out just as you want. Is, is she actually um, planning to do this? Is there actually a plan or is this just all a yarn that she's spinning him in order to, to, to you know, wreak her own revenge? Lynn? Okay, my guess, we'll see how this turns out is that she's really pranking Cuddy. Cuddy is a comic character, so that kind of makes me feel like this is the first living thing you see, follow her and embrace her, which I think is probably euphemistic. Um, so he, she's basically tricking him into committing some kind of bestiality. That's my guess, we'll see. No, no, yeah. it was it was the living the living thing will lead you to her yeah. and then yeah. embrace oh, her. He wasn't yeah. in there was there was no yeah. bestiality. No. <laughs> just just plain old rapiness, just, I'm afraid. Just plain old rapiness. To be fair though, I mean, even whether she's playing along with I mean, I I I'm I'm I don't know, because I, I haven't read beyond this point yet. So it, it could be that there is an actual plan here. I'm getting the impression that she's she's leading him on but there's no doubt about it that the plan is rapey and he basically came to her saying uh i want a rapey plan um you know so so even though it, whether she's actually a uh, means to follow through or not but it you know this this does not reflect well on on cuddy banks so yeah he is a he is a comic mm -hmm. character but he's also kind of fairly reprehensible um elizabeth then rachel yeah, he is a quite a rapey character. Um, he's not coming off well. Um, I was quite concerned about the familiar. I know that that's a concept that you hear about witches and, and warlocks, that they have a familiar that kind of goes around and does their business. It's usually an animal of some sort. Usually I found it was a cat mm. that women are supposed to have, but in this it's a dog. And I find the whole like licking of the blood <laughs> to be quite um, gross yeah. and to be quite <laughs> off-putting. I wondered what the Latin was that the dog taught Sawyer to say. 
Uh, Lois, yeah. <laughs> that's so tame to you. <laughs> yes, uh, it just means hallowed be thy name. Uh, and it's addressed, you know, being addressed to the devil, of course. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's like a devil worshipping yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I think the thing about the scene is that uh, I don't think we really even know whether she's got any genuine power at this point. I mean, mm -hmm. she hasn't actually made anything happen. So she could still just be trying it all out and, you know, making stuff up mm -hmm. as she goes. But, but you know, the, the whole the play's uh, attitude to witchcraft is, is curious here because you could, up to the point where the black dog appears, start to th think that, uh, you know, from a 20th, 21st century point of view, there is no witchcraft. It's all just in the way people treat uh, poor old women and imagine it. But then, the, you know, then this familiar appears as a black dog. It's got to be a dog because a, a, an actor could play a black, large black dog. It couldn't play a cat, really. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, or a mouse or a toad or, you know, any of the other things. Uh, oh. So, but we suddenly get genuine, uh, you know, genuine evil appearing. So the whole thing changes. The whole thing changes, and that that whole bit where, where uh, you know, where she, where he, where he licks her blood, it it is, it's it's kind of everybody. I could see everybody's reactions. Everyone was going, "Ew!" Uh, but I, I, it's kind of you want that in a way, or at least I find it interesting that the playwright have have put that in because it changes the atmosphere of the play instantly it raises the stakes it takes it into a much darker and and uh, uh, more discomforting place which of course is perhaps what we were expecting uh, in a in a play called the witch of edmonton and then we kind of got sidetracked with all this other stuff about marriages and, and what have you i do find the idea of the familiar interesting though because um like witches familiars they tend to be their servants whereas although this dog is claiming to serve her i get the impression that he is a separate entity who has appeared to her he is the one with the power here not her and that sh changes the witch familiar dynamic slightly or at least the witch familiar dynamic as i understand it but that's just something to to think about um elizabeth i'll come back to you and then lynn and then rachel then briny yeah, because she asks, she asks um, the dog to go and kill old Banks, mm. and the dog says he can't do it, mm. that it's not within his power, that only he can only affect like Banks' things, his land and his cattle. Mm. Um, so that's an interesting one, because is. Banks is horrible to Sawyer, but nice to other people. Mm. He has some sort of moral standing somewhere. Mm. Oh, but I mean, you get that quite often with people, don't you? I mean, you get people who are like, oh, I love my I love my Romanian neighbours, but oh, they should all go back to their own country, but not my neighbours because they're lovely. I mean, I get the impression he's he's sort of he's, he's one of those a bit, but who knows? Uh, Lynn. Yeah, that is really interesting. I, what I was wondering if in a modern production, you could kind of go against the grain a little bit and um, and make it clear that, and, and you know, your interpretation, could it be that um, um, Mother Sawyer just kind of, at this point, has a breakdown and starts hallucinating. Ooh, yeah. The dog isn't real, she's imagining it. Or there's really a dog, a dog happens to wander by, but she thinks she hears it talking. Mm -hmm. And that would kind of explain the dog saying, oh yeah, I have powers, but I can't kill anybody. I can't kill him because he's basically a decent person. So that's why, because the, because the dog's powers don't really exist. Mm. She's just hallucinating this whole thing. That may be impossible to, to, uh, to play out. You might have some real magic that you can only explain by supernatural um, uh, explanations later in the play, but I wonder if that would work. I like that idea. I have no idea if it would work, but I think it's, it's certainly a, a, a theme we could look out for next time to see see if it if, if it if it could work because it's a it's a really interesting idea uh rachel then briny um i was just going to talk about parallels again like uh the beginning of the the beginning of where we started up again after the discussion where the black dog comes in um uh you know that uh i think selling your soul to the devil isn't anybody's first you know choice of getting out of a bad situation and we have that parallel before with arthur you know, or the parallel that I'm proposing uh, with between Arthur and Winifred, where she calls herself a whore. And he says, uh, you know, he starts cursing and saying that he'll make the money situation and change her mind about that. And, you know, as a profession, 
that's not, you know, prostitution isn't the first thing that people, you know, pick. Um, and then also uh, Winifred getting married to Frank. Um, there's something uh, in the dog drinking Sawyer's blood that's very ceremonial. You know, mm. it's a vow yeah. that's taken the vow. And then immediately afterward, the dog goes back on it, mm. you know, and he says mm. he can't kill and he won't do yeah. these things. And there's a sudden, sh the promise is broken. Yeah. Uh, and there's a shift in that power. Um, mm. And I, I think that, you know, the dog instead of the cat, um, you know, I think people project, you know, anthropomorphic ideas onto animals. And there's that, you know, dog is a man's best friend mm. and cats have a womanly association. Um, and I think there's something in this that a, a animal that has a sort of masculine association is um, who she makes the devil, the, the, this devil pact with and the, you know, in the, the hallowed be your name towards the devil instead of God, you know, the reverse marriage that she's made, mm. maybe, perhaps. Yeah, no, I do like that parallel um, that there's, yes, it's like this play is, is, is grappling with um, uh, different types of different levels of disenfranchisement to a, to a certain degree. And that pan parallel between Winifred and um, Sawyer is actually growing stronger, if anything, or at least that's one way of interpreting it. Um, Bryony. Um, yeah, I agree with with a lot of what's just been said, but I think some of these decisions, some of the, the they're, they're bound by the the current facts about witches of the day. Mm. So the whole suckling thing is absolutely this is what witches do. We know yeah. they do this. That's what a witch mark is: is an extra nipple where the the mm. devil, in the form of a familiar, has suckled upon them. That's totally a thing that that people knew about witches at the time. Mm. Um, the familiar thing. I know cats have stuck, but I think it was pretty much any animal. Yeah. If somebody is is you know more interested in animal than people, then there's definitely something wrong with them. They're probably a witch. Um, and this whole thing with him, I don't think he broke any vows. The, the dog when he said he couldn't hurt Banks because it's it's the rules of of witchcraft is that if you are holy, then the devil can't get you. And the devil only had that in with Sawyer because she was cursing all the time already, mm. um, almost. And and so if you follow those societal rules and go to church and whatnot, you could be horrible and abusive to, to women in the street for no reason. But as long as you praise God or whatever, then mm. the devil can't get you. And it's kind of those rules that they're kind of working within, I think. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's an interesting uh, point. I mean, I don't know that he's that holy, old Banks, um, but 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 demons do quite often, uh, even really powerful demons, uh, operate under rules. I mean, I'm thinking about uh, Faustus, you know, and uh, Mephistopheles. Even he, even he has rules that he has to follow. So it's a you know it's a good point. Uh, Lois, uh, I will come to you. And then if you could segue from your point into your final thought, because we really do have to wrap this up. We've talked a long time about this because it's fascinating. Right. Well, I mean, at this time, Dr. Faustus was still a popular play and was, in fact, being performed. And the, uh, the scene in which uh, uh, the, the black dog appears, he says, yeah, you know, I, have, I found you cursing. Now you're my own. And if you remember, uh, Faustus makes a very long incantation to call up the devil and then discovers later that Mephistopheles came simply because, as he says, uh, when we hear one rack the name of God, abjure the scriptures and his savior Christ, we fly and hope to get his glorious soul. And that's really why he came. Uh, and you can forget about conjuring and just you know, pray to the prince of hell or start cursing. Mm. So that it would be interesting to see this as to some extent, you know, a transposition of the Faust story to uh, to a very low level, uh, you know, poor, ignorant old woman, as opposed to a highly educated scholar uh, selling her soul to the devil. Mm, yeah. Um, right. Final thoughts. We're going to have to be very quick, people, but we're because we're running out of time. But uh, who would like to go first? Because I'm sure you've all got plenty to say. Lynn. Muted. Of course I am. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Brian is right they, that there were these there were lots of things that people thought they knew about witchcraft and sort of the nature of the cosmos. Um, and this play was was generated with those 
with those knowledges in place. But I wonder, I wonder if you were to produce this today, if you could make this text actually really interrogate and undermine those assumptions uh, that, um, um, that the, how skeptical can you make it and how much of the, the, the blame for everything that goes wrong is, is shifted from sort of the cosmos and the devil to human selfishness and, uh, and corruption. Yeah, I you know when when we get to the end of this text, I mean, I think that's something that would be really interesting to think about is how how skeptical can we make it um, with with what we've got? Yes, exactly. How how much of the evil is supernatural and how much of it is in humans? Uh, Elizabeth, do you have any final thoughts? Yes, my final thought was just about the tone of the text and about what like what a leap it was from the first act to the second, whereas we had this kind of like you, I think you described it as like a play of manners. Mm. And it was all about oh, who's sleeping with who and who's deceiving who and who's Winifred's the father of Winifred's child, blah, blah, blah. You know, will will Francis marry uh, Susan, stuff like that. It'd be, and then it moves into this really dark avenue, yeah. which is all about witchcraft and demonology and, and familiars. I think it did that segue with the clowns very well. Yeah. And I felt the clowns were a very good medium through which to kind of transfer us yeah. from almost the secular space to a more spiritual um, liminal space. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and and the fact that it does segue like you've got these you've got the A and the B plot, and they appear to not have much in common yet in terms of plot. But as Rachel has said, the themes, uh, the the echoes uh, are reflecting each other really rather in quite a fascinating way. Rachel, do you have any very quickly? Do you have any final points? Uh, love Decker, love Ford, love the play so far. Hope Sawyer is being a false narrator like Arthur and um, Frank, and that she's not actually going to help Cuddy um, uh, rape that woman. Mm. Uh, I would love it to stay as feminist as it seemed so far. Um, really, uh, just really enjoying it. Uh, can't wait for tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. Me, me too. Uh, Eric, any quick final thoughts? I object. No, yeah, I'm kidding. Yeah, uh, as a dog. No, uh, yeah, um, yeah. No, I, I hadn't realized that the dog was so shady when I started reading it, and then it's like because, uh, yeah, uh, having knowing that I was going to be playing a dog, I was like, oh yeah, this is totally a comedy character. Oh wait, no. Oh uh, wait. <laughs> um, and g giving the dog that voice with the, it was very sort of like, oh my god, oops, what have I just done? No, I think um, it kind of make, Making a jest of like, I'll turn you into a thousand pieces mm. it, it was very sort of okay oops um yeah, no, yeah i don't know yeah creepy though like yes yeah. yeah yeah in terms of final thoughts um i'm enjoying this play because i don't know what's coming next it's kind mm. of what yeah I'm yeah no it, that, that's very true i have i have no clue Bryony, quick 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 anything to add yeah I, I, I think it's been wonderful really interesting to read it in a room that is like six to one female heavy um <laughs> i think there's a lot to be had in it i'm i'm really interested in lynn's ideas on how you could bring this to a modern day audience but i couldn't really comment on that just yet because i have no idea where it's going next and that is so exciting yeah it is uh lois any final final thoughts Oh, I thought I'd given them. I, I was trying to, uh, you asked me to segue into them yep. before. Yeah, absolutely. So, right. Okay, then we are, we are all wrapped up for this first part of The Witch of Edmonton. It's been thrilling on several different levels, and I shall look forward to uh, carrying on tomorrow. Um, all that remains for me today is to thank the wonderful readers uh, for their input uh, and uh, talented performances today. And uh, we'll see you next time. When the moon's in the full, then the wit's in the wane. <laughs>